From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Ahead today, K-State's Sandy Johnson joins Jeff Wickman to talk about a recent survey in Canada, which polled cow-calf producers there about their herd management practices. She thinks what was learned from that survey is valuable information for cow-calf operations here in this region. Then K-State's Brad White and Bob Weber will take on two timely topics in cow-calf management, contending with muddy herd feeding and calving conditions and providing supplemental colostrum to those newborn calves. And on this week's horticulture segment later on, K-State's Ward Upham will conclude his look at new garden plant varieties which have just earned the distinction of All-America selections. All that here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. A recent article in the K-State Department of Animal Sciences and Industries' January Beef Tips newsletter looks at a survey conducted in Western Canada in 2016 that detailed management practices associated with calving and describes calving management practices and the relationship of herd demographics with various measures of calf health. K-State Research and Extension Beef Specialist Sandy Johnson, who is based in Colby, highlighted some of the findings of that survey from 97 of 110 herds from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, a region that produces 77% of the beef animals in Canada. She joins us now to discuss some of the highlights of that survey and how other cow-calf producers might be able to use the survey findings to improve their own cow-calf management practices. Sandy, in terms of this, maybe some background on why there is an interest in benchmarking. Well, you know, this time of year, we're we're thinking about the Super Bowl. Maybe we've been to the stock show. You know, it's it's common to our personalities, I think, to want to compare our sports talents or our animals to the next guys. And when it comes to managing a business, whether it's selling widgets or livestock benchmarking can help us better understand our business and maybe where our weak spots and our, our strong spots are. And unfortunately, on our, for our cow-calf herds, there's not a lot of data in that regard. So when some comes along, uh, even though it's not perfect, we need to kind of stop and take a look at it and see how it compares or what we can le- glean from it. Along those lines, then, what can we take maybe some of the pros from this survey that they did in Canada? Well, one is as we look at what the survey was, not everybody's geography for Canada may be as good as the uh, United States. So essentially they surveyed about 100 herds that would correspond from the provinces from Montana to western third of Minnesota. So that what they would consider western Canada. And they were all part of a group that was providing data for some health perspectives anyway. And from that, we might glean that perhaps they're a little bit better managers or they're interested in improving their herd. So we just have to understand where that group comes from. But very typical, I think, to what we would see here in Kansas, they were about three-fourths of them were commercial producers, and about 20% had both commercial and, and purebred females. Average herd size, about 225, which probably is not the average of our entire state, but certainly we have many herds that are in that size range. They just have reported essentially calving months of January through May. There was very few May calvers, so those were grouped in really with April. And as we look at the U.S. data, probably the most common month to have a calf born is March, and that's similar for what this Canadian data was, and one might have thought there would be more later, more towards the April and May, but 
that wasn't the case. So. So this makes us very timely from the standpoint that we're kind of into that calving season. And one of the things that the survey really focused in on was assistance. And that's one of the things that you wanted to focus in on as well. Right. You know, it's hard for us to, d- depending on our herd size, you know, how, how many females should we assist every year or how many C-sections, those types of things. Well, the average percent calving assistance in this study group was about 5% of all births, 13.5% for heifers, 3% for cows. And that's really similar to what a 2007 USDA NOMS study reported. We're still waiting for the most recent NOMS survey that should be out any time now. So that that part is fairly similar. We know that we have drastically reduced the, the incidence of need for assistance over time but we know that animals that, whether it's the cow that need, if the cow, the cow is impacted by the fact we have to pull a calf, we can delay reproduction or, or worse. The calf is also impacted if there's a delay in birth, might be failure uh, to take in the antibodies, increased incidence of illness. So it's important for us to kind of have an idea of, you know, what, what should we expect from our own herds and kind of track that. And I thought an interesting part of this that I don't know that we have a U.S. Well, there could be a U.S. number for this, but I'm not sure I know where that number is. Treatment for disease prior to weaning averaged about 9%. 3% of the calves were treated for diarrhea and similar amounts for BRD. And then pre-weaning mortality, so calves that died between birth and weaning was about 4.5%. So again, I think those are just kind of some good benchmark numbers for us to use when, you know, evaluating calf health and fitness in our own herds. The survey also asked about the frequency of checking animals, and I found that to be kind of interesting as well. Right. It's it's always interesting as you try to word these questions. Um, I was comparing the U.S survey wording versus this, and of course, they can't always put in there all the, well, did I really expect anybody to even calve tonight, you know, whether or not I went out there and how many head I was, am I calving 200 of synchronized heifers, or am I waiting for one or two more to calve in that frequency? So there's always challenges in, in wording in that, and the nice thing about this study is that you could read all the details and and what they observed by going to our cashewbeef.org site, looking for the beef tips link. And this article is listed in our January issue of beef tips, and at the bottom is a link to the full article. Because we are in, in coming up on calving season, some may be starting to calve heifer soon, Maybe it's uh, better to think about the timing of intervention in in terms of what we would recommend for our producers here. And so generally, if we think about starting from the standpoint when we're in stage two labor, and that's when the water sack is visible, we want to think about whether or not that cow or heifer is making progress. And if if we, you know, if, if they've been trying and no progress is made, the time to intervention if we're closely observing that, you know, maybe that's as little as 30 minutes. If indeed we're watching closely, no progress is made. But if she's still making progress, you know, we're probably going to be giving that heifer up to two hours, a cow, you know, one hour. And anytime we see things like the wrong combination or orientation of, of feet and Perhaps it's it's no nos uh, those those things we want to explore much sooner, and um, you know any time the cow quits trying for say fifteen to twenty minutes, it's it's time to be looking more closely because it's certainly the timeliness of that assistance can make a lot of difference to the cow reproduction and the, and the calf health. Along those same lines, the the fact that we're making sure that they're getting the colostrum right away is also important, and it looks like that was something that they did visually quite well. Yeah, they ask them how how did they verify that, and in some cases then they were, I think, visualizing things 
looking at the fullness of the cow's udder or the or or whether or not the calf looked full and then if if we didn't think they had uh, received colostrum then most commonly they're going to pair those together and either helping the calf nurse or putting them together were equal frequency in terms of methods and less frequent than was tube feeding. As you were saying, it's often difficult to find this data in the U.S., so this is actually something that maybe our cow-calf producers could go online, look at the survey, and maybe think about their practices and how they might answer those questions. Right. I think producers always enjoy seeing what other producers are doing, and I think that's part of the interest for me, and I think as well as other producers, is how does the next guy do it? And this adds the added part of how do they do it in Canada? We, we always know that you can't get too much information, right? Right. And again, if they want to take a look at this survey, how can they find that? Yes, if you go to ksubeef.org and look for the beef tips link over on the right-hand side, the January issue of Beef Tips has this article and at the bottom of the article is a link to the full text paper. And in terms of scientific papers I might present to you, I think this is something a lot of people will find they can read. It's not too not too technically written that you can't work your way through it. You can still glean a lot of good points from it. That's K-State Research and Extension Beef Specialist Sandy Johnson discussing the findings of a survey of Western Canada calving management practices. Again, to read Sandy's article or to get the link for the full survey, go to ksubeef.org. Then click on the Beef Tips link on the right side of the page. The article is in the January newsletter. Agriculture Today continues after the break. This is the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. We're back with Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. Coming to you from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University is another BCI Cattle Chat. Participating in this week's podcast is veterinarian Brad White and cow-calf specialist Bob Weber. Brad tells us here the topics they'll be focusing on this time around. I want to talk some about mud management. We've also got a listener question on colostrum management. But I'd like to start out by talking about mud control and mud management what do we do cow calf herd it's this time of year it's going to be frozen then it's later in the afternoon it may thaw out we've got moisture making muddy pits around the round bales other areas any tips or tricks yeah so uh i'm deploying some newly learned technology so basically strategically putting out round bales and using electric fence to control access to those sites so that you don't get you know one spot where you feed all the time i think that's a, a good plan to implement and I, i've done similar so you move the and i've got some set up on in different locations so that it's a lot easier to move the cattle when you've got the bale right there you've got an electric fence around it you drop the fence put a bale ring over it and you're and good you're to go good. so it also helps you keep from driving the tractor through those areas where you get the ruts and the real muddy spots yep. but you need to do it and prepare in advance yeah. any any tips or tricks for where you put those bales? Well, I think um, as I kind of looked at my spot, I picked a site that's pretty well drained, so it's got actually a, a fair bit of grade to it just to kind of find a spot that's – I got some soft spots around. I'm like, I sure don't want to put it there because one of the issues is is you've got your round bales now sitting on end, and so they're a little susceptible to a lot of moisture, and they're going to be there a while. They're not as, as weatherproof as they are when they're you know laying down longwise. So, so I tried to pick a spot that's pretty well drained partially to kind of control – and keep you know it's high ground so hopefully it doesn't get as wet and soppy as some other spots and kind of control so, that. and so. part of this is the trade-off between you, you're going to have some ground that when it's muddy and mucky you, you're going to really tear up that ground it's going to be hard to get something to come back in the next year yep. and so you don't want to tear up too much ground 
but you also want to have enough area for the cattle to get into. And what we're describing is the concept of you've got a feeding area. And the nice thing about both what, what you've described and, and kind of what I've seen is if you've got a trap or a pen, that then when it does start to dry out and you can feed somewhere else, you can actually close them out of that area and give that area a little time yep. to rest and heal before you need to use it again for the next muddy spell. I think the big challenges we face is we kind of punch it up and then it really accumulates moisture and gets muddier. So and stays and stays muddy. It stays muddy, right? So yeah, out. getting it getting it leveled back off and, and kind of prepared for the next so when it does dry out it's in, in pretty good shape to shed water. I, I think really think about your mud management plan when it's not muddy, when it is muddy, there's there's limited things we can do, but move it around, try to tear up a, a minimal amount of areas. The other thing we wanted to talk about, and it ties right in as we think about calving season, we got a question from a, a listener here in Kansas relative to colostrum management and thinking about these calves that are being born now. And the question was, how many hours, if I have a cow and a calf and I haven't seen the calf nurse, how many hours should I wait before I intervene and make sure that calf has, has received his colostrum? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great question, and uh, I suspect one of a fair bit of a debate. People yeah. have differing views on how that should go down. Mine is I'm, I, I try and balance it between, particularly on the, the group that's usually of concerns, maybe some first calf heifers. So it's all new to them, right? And so their maternal instincts may not be as, uh, as good as a mature cow. And so I, I typically don't let heifers go too long. So you know, two to four hours if that calf's not up and nursing, I'm getting in the middle of that. But I don't want to get in the middle of it right away because then I've, I've disrupt the bonding activity between the cow and the calf. And there's, you know, the, the last thing you want is that cow to drop the calf and walk away and go, well, you're taking care of it. I'm not going to. So. so I'm going to go the other way. I'm not going to jump in and intervene until the calf tells me by him being down not wanting to be up or you see him trying to nurse off other cows and not making any progress so that would be my scenario for when i jump in to intervene so how many hours i'm leaning more towards yeah it might be the next day or two if i didn't observe any problems or anything else related to that listener question you and i gave different answers so biologically though what what kind of time window are we looking at for good absorption of great IgG so proteins. So when we look at the colostrum, and, and let's think about the colostrum management. So colostrum is that first milk that the calf gets that contains a lot of the immunity from his mother to set him up really for the first four or five months of his life. Yeah, so all the passive immunity he gets all comes from colostrum. comes from that first milk, and his gut starts closing, honestly, when he starts drinking. So once he starts drinking, you've got 12 to 24 hours after that. As a rule of thumb, people say 12 to, 12 to 24 hours after he's born, assuming that he kind of drank something right away. But it's really once that first little bit hits his gut. So giving him a little bit and then saying, well, I hope he's going to nurse his mom tonight is not a strategy I would employ because what we did was we started gut closure without giving him enough protein. So if you're going to supplement, get after it. Yeah, get yeah. after it yeah. and move right away. And we need to think about... I mean, as we think about colostrum, let's talk about colostrum management because that's critical because it's that first immunity that he gets. One of the key things is the body condition of that cow, if she's in good shape, because colostrum is made of, I'll say immunity, but immunity comes in the form of proteins. And those proteins, she has to have the nutrition to do it. So making sure our cows are in good body condition score at calving not only helps breeding, but helps our quality and quantity of colostrum. And the colostrum that we get, it's a level of immunity, but that immunity is only as effective as the challenge we place it under. So where this cow calves may have different challenges. So we talked about mud earlier. So if if the calf is born in mud, there's a couple factors there. One, her udder may be covered with lots of contaminants that gives him a high pathogen challenge. Or two... It physically is just hard for him to get up and nurse, yeah. right? If, so he, if he's he not born in a muddy herring, then yeah, yeah, yeah. he's got to be in a good place. What about in a dystocia case or a difficult calving? When do you intervene then? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, and you know, my my general strategy is, you know, if it's a if it's a, a light assist and the cow gets right up and she's doing fine and the calf's kind of got. Uh, uh, some vigor to him. I, I typically just walk away yep. and, and leave I'm him alone. You. But if it's a hard pull and the cow's not getting up and we got to do some resuscitation on the calf, um, I'm typically pretty inclined to uh, either 
get the cow up when she can and get her milked and yep. when you know my my goal is to get and i don't know if this is the right number about a quart at least of colostrum into the calf and i try a bottle first and if he won't do the bottle then it's to the esophageal feeder and making sure that you know those ones that are a little slow to get up they're most of the time not going to get a lot faster at getting up so getting some energy in them colostrum warming them up getting them dry get as many things right for that calf as you can because he's had a pretty hard start so. so the best thing for him is if i can get his mother's colostrum into him so if i can milk her out and if i need to tube feed him or if i need to give him a bottle if he'll take a bottle either one of those is by far the best Next best is colostrum that I may have banked or saved from before. But remember, so you used one quart is what you said. And I, and I think that's reasonable for some of our beef cows. A lot of our rules of thumb, people say, well, give them two quarts colostrum. Well, that's from our, our friends in the dairy world often. and their Two quarts col- colostrum for a dairy cow is a piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's no problem. But remember, she has a lot more milk. But maybe about the same level of proteins, it's just more dilute. More dilute. Right. Yeah. So you have to get – it's higher concentration in that beef colostrum. So quart, okay. If you can get more, excellent. Uh, milk it up from her. Give it – if you save dairy colostrum, you're, you're going to want to feed a little more. But remember, our, our calf size, we talked about heifers, dystocia, may be a little bit different. They may not be big enough to absorb all that right away. Yeah. So maybe a, do a, a quart of dairy colostrum early and, and then, then follow up follow relatively up in soon. two four hours another yep. round of that and then we also have to think about some of the commercial products that are available to either supplement or add to if i got the calf colostrum from his mom i'm less apt to augment that if i if she has no let's say it's a dystocia and she died and i didn't wasn't able to get any colostrum from her then I'm, I'm going to give that calf some sort of commercial colostrum replacement type therapy. Yeah. Brad, how thermally stable? So I'm thinking about these, uh, well, either colostrum that's been harvested and banked, so frozen. Okay. How should we handle that product or um, a, a powdered dry product? Great question. As so we prepare it to give to the calf. Temperature's, temperature's important. Temperature's important, and we want to warm it up so that it gets to reach the temperature that, that makes it For the calf, especially a lot of times it's cold weather, right? So we're going to warm it up. But we warm it up in a hot water bath. You don't put that in the microwave. Microwave, right? Yeah. Yeah. You microwave it, you're going to destroy a lot of those proteins. Denature the proteins. Yep. You just... It doesn't work as well. We've got to have the right equipment, the right preparation and everything on it. So mixing it with boiling water. Bad yep. idea, right? Yep. So, yeah. Yep. Water bath. Heating um, it up in or, a water bath in the Or on pre-temp the stove. in the water and then mixing it. Yeah. Yep. It's one so of the about few kinds of cooking that I can do is you heat up the water bath on the stove and you drop the frozen colostrum in. Just Target's about 100 degrees. Yep. Yeah. From the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University, that was Brad White and Bob Weber. Be sure to hear the entire podcast at beefcattleinstitute.org. Again, that is beefcattleinstitute.org. When we come back, Eric will have the agricultural news headlines and more. For Agriculture Today, I'm Britton Rucker, and we'll be back with more after this short break over the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says that Canada will move next week to formally approve the new North American Free Trade Agreement, the USMCA. Trudeau said the government will introduce a motion when Parliament resumes next Monday and will introduce legislation to ratify the deal two days later. Trudeau said that millions of Canadians depend on stable, reliable trade with their largest trading partners. That will effectively remove the final legal hurdle to the deal with the the U.S. and Mexico. Last week, the Senate here in the U.S. passed its implementation bill of USMCA. 
And Trudeau's government had been waiting for the U.S. to formally ratify the pact before introducing its own bill. Mexico, of course, ratified the deal back in June. Chinese Vice Premier Han Zheng told the World Economic Forum that that country's trade deal with the U.S. would not hurt rival exporting nations as complaints mount from governments that were left out of that agreement in the most high-profile remarks on Beijing's economic policies since the accord was signed last week. Han said that a commitment to purchase more from the U.S. is in line with its World Trade Organization obligations and will not squeeze out other imports. Han also pledged to lower barriers for foreign investors as he set out the case for China's engagement with the global market. Meantime, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin says that a phase two accord with China will not necessarily be what he called a big bang that removes all tariffs. Quoting Mnuchin, we dealt with a lot of important issues in phase one. He went on to say, if we get phase two done before the election, good. If not, fine. There is no deadline. And a senior U.S. Trade Representative Office leader notes that the incredible pace in reaching these new trade agreements is impressive, he says, and how that experience will benefit our country in future negotiations is impressive as well. Here's more from the USDA's Rod Bain. Japan, China, USMCA. All trade agreements made between the U.S. and these major trading partners, and all done, according to the chief ag negotiator of the U.S. Trade Representative's office, Greg Dowd, at a pace he referenced as historic compared to previous trade deals. Since I've been there in 22 months, we've renegotiated 51 percent of U.S. ag exports. He says in the case of our nation and USTR renegotiating a trade agreement with North American neighbors Mexico and Canada. In a period that almost killed the building. We were literally sleeping on our couches in our offices at night as we negotiated this. We did a Japan deal in six weeks that should have taken 16 months. And a significant amount of work regarding a deal with China. Ambassador Dowd says the experience gained in negotiating these trade agreements at an accelerated pace will be important as the U.S. works to secure additional trade deals in the near future with global markets such as India. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. On the calendar, Kansas State University experts and officials will be presenting the most current information on how to grow hemp, industrial hemp in Kansas, that is, based on the first year of research trials at the university's test plots around the state. The Industrial Hemp Conference is scheduled for Tuesday, February the 4th at the Sedgwick County Extension Education Center in the west part of Wichita. The conference will begin at 8.30 that morning, ending around 4 in the afternoon. Registration $50 per person if received by this coming Tuesday, the 28th, $75 after that date. They're encouraging any interested parties to register early because seating will be limited. That registration is available online by searching for K-State Industrial Hemp Conference or by calling 316-788-0492. This is open to all from the beginning grower to those considering growing industrial hemp on a larger scale. The topics will include disease and insect protection, regulations, laboratory testing opportunities, and growing hemp in high tunnels. For more information, visit the K-State Industrial Hemp Facebook page or call the Sedgwick County Extension Office. Again, their phone number is 316-788-0492. An industrial hemp conference being hosted by K-State Tuesday, February the 4th at the Sedgwick County Extension Education Center. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and next up, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. And standing by, as usual, with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? Kim Coles is joining us. She is a member of the Kansas Soybean Yield and Value Contest Committee. And, Kim, those committee results and tracks were handed out at the Kansas Soybean Expo. And we go back to 2019, which was a very challenging year for soybean producers and for the soybean industry. You know, we had the wet spring, late planting, and I think that did impact our contest entries. We had a little bit lower than last year, but we appreciate the farmers for taking the time and putting them in. The Soybean Yield and Quality Contest really gives us 
the chance to highlight farmers for their contributions to provide such a great quality and high yielding supply to our markets. Well then, let's get to some of the results. Who were some of the winners this year? So we have eight different districts across the state that we separate up the contest in just based on geographical regions and, and the different yields that can be expected from those areas. The full list, if it, people are interested, can be found online at kansasoybean.org. Our top overall dryland state winner, first place, is Larmar and Company Farms from Brown County with a high yield of 94.01 bushels per acre. And then for the Kansas Soybean overall irrigated state winner, we had Love and Love Farms from Gray County with a yield of 88.82 bushels per acre. So we didn't cross the 100 bushel mark like we did last year, which was exciting. And so the yield to beat is still from last year at 104 bushels per acre. Still looking forward to that as coming years. But we had some great yields, some great entries, and we really appreciate, again, those farmers that took the time to enter. What were some of the other results that we had? So going into the value side of the contest, Gareth Pettijohn from Saline County had a 6.45% premium for value on their soybeans. Jeff Wessel from Sheridan County, 6.51% premium. And the Longenecker Farms are our first place from Dickinson County with 7.19% premium. We also looked at just protein in general, since protein is such a valued thing in the market right now. And Chris Bodenhausen from Atchison County had a protein percentage of 37.3%, so the highest protein in our contest. So some great value contest results uh, this year as well. And once again, if people would like to see the results, they can go to your website? All the results will be listed on the website, a lot more than what I mentioned here. I kind of hit the highlights and the top ones, but to see the rest and all the different districts we have, please go to our website and take a look. That's kansassoybeans.org. That is Kim Coles, a member of the Kansas Soybean Yield and Value Contest Committee, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. More new vegetables and ornamentals to try center stage in this week's K-State Horticulture segment. Next on Agriculture Today. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. Agriculture Today returns now, and for our horticulture segment this week, we've invited back by for an encore, Ward Upham, horticulturist with K-State Research and Extension. If you were listening in last week, you'll know that the new All-American Vegetable and Ornamental Selections have been announced. So last week, Ward, we got into the new tomatoes deemed All-Americans. This time around, a look at other All-American vegetables plus ornamentals, but remind of the process of designating plant material as All-American. So everything that All-America Selections tests, it's not released until it's been selected. These varieties you should be able to find. You may have to look a little bit, but you should be able to find them. When we talk about the different awards, there's a gold award that's only given once or twice every decade, and that's brand new stuff. In other words, it's like the sugar snap pea where we never had snap peas before. We also have national winners that do well across the U.S. and Canada. And then we have regional awards that do well in certain areas within those two countries. Mm -hmm. All the ones we have this week are national winners. Everything that we talk about today is adapted to Kansas growing conditions. So with that in mind, let's talk of three vegetables that, in addition to the tomatoes, have been deemed All-Americans. And one is a cucumber. And it's a mini cucumber. It's a little short cucumber. You pick these when they're three to four inches long. Okay, they, they'll they get bigger, but they're going to be best if you pick them when they're young and are gonna, going to get about 40 fruit per plant. So that gives you an idea of what your harvest is going to be. They are often not grown just sprawling on the ground. They are grown up. So like they can be grown on stakes, poles. What a lot of people in Kansas use is livestock panels. 
They work really well for this type of thing because they are tough. They're going to support that weight. And just a couple of T-posts on both sides, and you got something that's simple and works really well. Succession plants can be used in order to extend the harvest. In other words, you plant some. Maybe wait a couple weeks, plant some more, that type of thing. They can extend the harvest a little bit. And this cucumber's proper name is? Green light. This is green light. So look for that. There's a new pumpkin out there as well. It's uh, drawn the All-American honor. It's called Blue Prince. And its claim to fame is it's not orange on the outside. The inner flesh is, but the outside is kind of a bluish gray color. And so some people will like that, some people will not. But even if you don't like that coloration, the interior is very good for making pies, that type of thing. It's almost completely filled with flesh. And so if you want to harvest them and make your own pumpkin pies, this would be a good selection. Now, these fruit are about seven to nine pounds, so they're not huge fruit. But as I said, that interior is non-stringy, orange, savory, and sweet. So it's a really good one, especially if you want to use that material in the middle in order to make pies. So don't be thrown off by its outward appearance. Blue Prince is perfectly good for those baking and cooking purposes. That's right. Now, there is a new watermelon earning All-American status. And that's called Mambo. And Mambo is a smaller melon. And if you look through the past on All-American selections, usually the watermelons they pick are small. Mm -hmm. They're going to be icebox type. Now, this is maybe a little bit larger than some we've had in the past. It's about 9 inches in diameter, about 11 pounds. So if you look back like at our Crimson Sweet, which was developed at K-State, it's going to be 20 to 25 pounds. This is going to be half of that. Uh, It looks the same coloration as Crimson Sweet, just a smaller version. And it's also very quick in order to produce fruit, about 75 days from transplant. It also has a small seed cavity. Therefore, you get more flesh around where you don't have to spit out the seeds. So that's another good characteristic. So that'd be one if you want an icebox melon, fairly small one, this would be one to try. If one's limited on their growing space, this would be one consideration. Yes. Uh, As far as a watermelon goes, it's called mambo. Now there are four ornamental flower types that have earned All-American status as well and adapted to Kansas conditions. What do you have? So the first one is a coleus. So it's grown for the foliage. It will flower, but people usually don't like the flowers. And one of the characteristics of this one is it flowers late. So you get more of the summer where you don't have to cut off the flowers if you don't like them. It's called Main Street, Beale Street coleus. So it has good red coloration. It doesn't fade as the summer progresses. A lot of times with these coleus, the color starts to fade once it gets really hot. This one doesn't do that. The other claim to fame it has is that you can grow it in full sun. Usually when you think of coleus, you think of growing them in the shade. This does well in the shade, but it also does does well in full sun. However, you can't buy the seed. You have to buy the plants. And therefore, you're going to have to find some garden center that grows them for you. But you're looking for Main Street, Beale Street, Coleus, and it's an all-American ornamental winner, as is what's called a sombrero burgundy. (laughs) What is the story behind this one? So this is sombrero Baja burgundy, and it's a coneflower. If you're familiar with purple coneflowers, this is what this is. It has very vibrant, deep, violet-red blossoms that you can use as cut flowers. You don't have to use it just for that purpose. It makes a good plant in the garden. But if you want cut flowers, this one will work for that. Those plants are sturdy, they're hardy, they're floriferous, which means they produce a lot of blooms, and it's a great pollinator plant and deer resistant. So if you have problems with deer, this may be one you want to consider. So Echinea sombrero, Baja burgundy, (laughs) the full name there. And there is a compact rose that made the list too, you say. Yeah, this is actually a nasturtium, and it's known as tip-top rose. And that's because of the color. It has rose-colored flowers that are born above medium green foliage. So it produces more flowers than the standard types, and the blooms, again, don't fade with age. And so keep that good color until those flowers actually die. And the last on this list, it's a black-eyed Susan, is that right? Yes, also known as a Rebecca, but most people know those as black-eyed Susan, and it's called American Gold Rush. Its flowers are golden yellow with black centers. Plants are more compact, have a smaller foliage than other Rebecca's, 
also has really good disease resistance. So if you like black-eyed Susans, this is a good choice. Very well. Well, there's much more detail to all of these, and there are a couple of ways folks can learn more about them. One is go to the All-American Selections website and the address all-americanselections.org, or simply search for the K-State Horticulture Newsletter, and you'll find much more information, including photos of all of the All-American Selections vegetables or ornamentals to whet your appetite for our gardening season, which uh, isn't all that that far away. Looking forward to it, as a matter of fact. And Ward, thank you for coming over. You bet. That from Ward Upham, horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension on this week's horticulture segment. And with that, our time's away for today. Thanks, as always, for listening in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. <music>